Good evening, Brown community and everyone else tuning in tonight from wherever in the world you may be. It is my enormous honor to welcome you to the 15th and very last in our series of Brown Fashion Week talks, which are being broadcast live from the beautiful campus of Brown University here in historic Providence, Rhode Island. I'm Sasha Pinto, the president of Fashion at Brown, and tonight our speaker series culminates with an exceptional event because we are speaking with none other than the amazing Gwyneth Paltrow, who rose to fame as an Academy Award winning actress in too many wonderful films to name, but who my generation grew up knowing as Pepper Potts, although we also love her in The Politician these days. Her brilliant acting career, however, is not what we're here to talk about tonight because Gwyneth Paltrow is also the founder and CEO of a wildly successful $250 million wellness and lifestyle brand that is taking the world by storm, changing the conversation and blazing trails while occasionally breaking the internet in the process. It all began in 2008 as a homespun newsletter of healthy recipes, travel tips, and shopping finds that Gwyneth typed up in her kitchen and emailed to friends. And a year later, make that 150,000 friends. And 10 years after that, Goop had a community of 8 million subscribers who shared Gwyneth Paltrow's belief that every choice counts. And today, Goop is a powerhouse organization of some 250 employees with a treasure trove of a website where food, shopping, wellness, and mindfulness collide in thousands of pages of free, cutting-edge content. Goop offers twice-weekly podcasts with experts, as well as a steady stream of timely articles on wellness, beauty, food, and recipes, along with in-depth travel guides, and so much more. Goop entered the e-commerce space in 2014, offering fashions and housewares initially, and a year later launched a publishing imprint. In 2016, they created their own fashion label and added clean beauty products to their offerings. And in 2017, Goop entered the vitamin and supplement market and sold $100,000 worth of product on launch day alone. Wow. Brick and mortar shops and pop-ups came next. And in 2017, Goop held the first of its full day experiential wellness summits that now take place around the world with hundreds in attendance. Last year, the Goop Lab documentary series premiered on Netflix, and just a few weeks later, Goop opened a ghost kitchen food service of whole, unprocessed meals to the Los Angeles area. So suffice it to say, as a fully shoppable lifestyle brand, Goop has become an indispensable resource that, by all accounts, is at the epicenter of the multi-trillion dollar wellness industry, with one person leading the conversation. And so... With that, it is our enormous honor to welcome that one person, Ms. Gwyneth Paltrow. Hello, Gwyneth. How are Hi. you? I'm good. How are you? Thank you for that very kind introduction. Oh, it's my pleasure. And let me just start by saying how incredibly generous it is of you to join us at Brown Fashion Week. We are so grateful. My pleasure. Well, Gwyneth, how are things in, in California? Are you working from home or have your beautiful office in, offices in Santa Monica opened again? No, we there's no sign of us opening the office anytime soon. So we're, we're cozy at home and, you know, it's been, been very much the same for 12 months now. So we're very used to it. Yeah, I mean, so few offices are open. In fact, we were talking to Vanessa Friedman of the New York Times last week, and she said the Times building won't open again until mid-September, which, wow, seems like such a long time from now. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's been a rough year in so many ways, but have you and your family found any comforting routines during this year of isolation? I think we've had you know, we, we, we tried to turn lemons into lemonade very quickly. Um, you know, and it's, it's been an incredibly challenging year for all of us in many ways. And for some of us more so than others, but I think we will fondly look back at the family time that we've been able to have and just the slowing down of of life and yeah. um, getting to really sort of just be where you live. And, you know, it, it's funny when you rush around all the time, you can avoid uh, dealing with a lot of stuff, you know? So when you're home and you're, you're sort of present, um, it's, been, it's been a very interesting year on a lot of levels. 
Yeah. Yeah. I know that's true. I was home for a huge amount of time, more time than in a long time. And my family and I played a lot of board games and ping pong and I miss it now that I'm back on campus. Right. Cool. But, but moving along, let's talk about Goop. And I'd love to start on a higher altitude by getting your thoughts on the connection between actors and entrepreneurs, because I've heard you talk about how the two seem to spring from the same DNA, which is so interesting. Yeah, you know, it struck me, somebody asked me this question a few years ago, and it really struck me that I think all artists are at heart entrepreneurs, right? I mean, there's so many parallels between what it takes to create and channel and, you know, have just insane self-belief. And I, I, and, you know, artists and entrepreneurs are, are, they have very similar DNA. In fact, I think of artists as entrepreneurs, but their Mm -hmm. businesses are what they're creating. Yeah, no, that's really interesting and and makes a lot of sense. And going back in time, I know you made your acting debut in high school, but were your sights set only on acting or did you harbor a secret interest in maybe starting a business one day? In high school, I was very focused on being an actress. My mom is an amazing actress and I had grown up watching her do incredible theater productions, one Mm -hmm. after the other, all the classics, Chekhov and Shakespeare and Tennessee Williams. And she was so self-possessed and so incredibly powerful on stage. And so I just wanted to be that and to do that. Um, I I was always interested in business and I've always been fascinated by it. And I always um, read the business (laughs) section of the New York Times first. Um, But I didn't, I didn't know until later that I really would give myself the latitude to even think about starting a business for a couple decades. Yeah. And I heard that the book Barbarians at the Gate piqued your interest in business. Yeah, it's true. I I read that book and another book called Liar's Poker huh. about Wall Street. And um, I was like, oh, this, this is so fascinating. This is more dramatic than any movie script I've ever read. <laughs> and then, I mean, fast forward and, and you're a highly successful actress, yet I found it so interesting that when Goop was just a newsletter coming out of your kitchen in 2008, that you didn't feel you had the authority to turn it into a business and that no one would take you seriously. So how did you break out of that mindset? Yeah, very much so. I mean, it, it, it took, it took many years. You know, I think as women, we tend to approach that entrepreneurial drive with some, you know, mitigation or trepidation. We think like that, you know, on some level, I I mean, certainly in my generation, I'm really hoping that in your generation, and I think I'm observing that in your generation, it has changed a lot, but certainly in my generation, um, we weren't really, shown that we could be entrepreneurs and start businesses in 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 that kind of a way so um it it certainly required a lot of um you know boundary expanding that i forced myself into having yeah yeah and and a decade later you're doing so well that you're asked to teach a class at harvard business school which (laughs) is quite a testament to your success as a businesswoman Um, but i'm curious did you have any interesting takeaways from your experience with the business school class well brown is the better ivy yes i 100 percent agree (laughs) thank you uh you're welcome um, no, it was an amazing experience to go there um, and to talk about the business, to present the business and to be in the hot seat. And um, and in fact, I go to also to Stanford every year to talk to the business mm-hmm. school there. And I love being able to talk to students and answer questions and, and hear them think about how they're kind of starting to frame up um, what business they're thinking about starting mm-hmm. and how they're thinking about being entrepreneurs and and, and the kinds of things that, that they want to know. And certainly Harvard was my first experience of that. And uh, I was, you know, I was a little intimidated going in there. I'm not going to lie. Um, but I think when you, you know, when you have to cultivate the kind of self-belief that it takes to be an entrepreneur, you know, you can quickly sort of click into, um, okay, I'm here. Like, I better just do this and do it to the full extent possible. Yeah. 
And maybe one day we can tempt you to Brown because we have a legendary business course that's the most popular class on campus. And I'm sure they'd be thrilled to have you as a visiting professor. Sign me up. I'll be there. <laughs> I will pass the word to Professor Hazeltine, the founder of the class. He would <laughs> love to have you. Great. But I'm <laughs> taking a step back, actually, because I suspect many Brown students listening tonight don't understand the full scope and vision of Goop. So can you tell everyone, what do you want the brand to stand for? And what is Goop actually all about? So Goop is really about connecting people to great things that will make their lives um, more easily to optimize, I would say. So I'm super passionate about connecting people to just that, anything that yeah. might um, offer them a tool that they can have a better experience. So that might be uh, pizza recommendation in, in Providence or oysters, or, or it might be um, a connection to, you know, a well, a piece of wellness content that might help them start to discover more about the questions that they have about themselves. Um, and, and everything's fair game. You know, we, we really want to eliminate any shame around asking questions. Um, we believe that all the potential of somebody um, can be optimized through asking questions right. and feeling uh, the right to ask those questions. And so, um, and we also really believe that, you know, the, if given the right conditions and information like any people can really manifest the life that they want yeah no that's so true and the occasional upwards what are they all about <laughs> well you know we were very very early in the wellness space i mean when we started talking about you know things that have become really mainstream now like acupuncture or gluten-free eating or you know healthier eating yeah. or um you know, energetic healing, like people just, the culture wasn't familiar with those things. And so a lot of times when you're breaking something on purpose, you're going to get a lot of um, uproar around it. And we've always really embraced ourselves as that kind of iconoclastic, um, trailblazing member yeah. of the culture because we're not afraid um, to ask those questions. And we're certainly not afraid of any backlash that might come from asking questions. And so what we always say is like, if we're, if we're in integrity, if we're doing something in integrity, then we are, we have the latitude to ask what and write about whatever thing that we do want to explore. Yeah. And looking at it from another angle, it's widely reported that doctors tend to play down women's health concerns. So does Goop speak especially to these women through its editorial content and, and wellness articles? Yes, absolutely. I mean, that's been going on for centuries. You know, women are, have been ignored. Um, you know, if you take something like, you know, women, for example, have, I think it's 10 to one more autoimmune than men. Mm. Um, women have more chronic fatigue, et cetera. And for many, many years, most doctors, um, allopathic physicians say, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. So take an antidepressant. Um, we, we've heard that from countless women in our community. And they, they say, no, I, I, I don't feel, I feel marginalized and I know that there's more going on and I want to be an active participant in my wellness. And so we like to provide the resources and information to help, you know, mostly women. We have a lot, we have some men readers too, but um, to help women really access those um, channels of information. Yeah. And like you mentioned, when you started talking about wellness 13 years ago, it was definitely considered alternative. And even your gluten-free cookbook was downright avant-garde. But yes. today, I mean, those of us in college don't even remember a time when gluten-free and celery juice weren't everywhere. Right. So what happened in the last decade that brought about such a surge of interest in wellness? And what role did Goop play in that? That's a great question. I mean, I will say, and I give my credit to, I give the credit to my editors, but I think that Goop played a super important role in that because we were in, we were publishing this information and we were making it okay for other people to publish the information and, right. and question the same things that we were questioning. And, um, and so, you know, I think we're largely credited for being 
always at the forefront in the wellness space. Um, and what was the first part of your question? No, I, I think you got it all. Well, got it. Okay. The surge of interest. In, yeah. In okay. Okay. Yeah. I, it, it's just, it's so interesting to see. I think that, oh, I know what it was. It's that, um, I really feel that what started to happen was people would try things, right? It's like, I don't yeah. feel great. I'm not getting the answers I want. Like, let me try to eat better or let me try to exercise or whatever the case may be. And once you implement some kind of program and you genuinely start to feel better, you start to understand that you have that autonomy over your health. Like you can be a participant in your wellness. And when people really understand that they get really excited about yeah. doing whatever wellness practice that might serve them well. And it's different for every single person. Right. And you were early on, on a number of these trends, weren't you? Oh yeah. Oh, I think pretty much all. I think so too. <laughs> and and right now the country is is divided politically, and it's also divided in terms of ideas. So, when it comes to skepticism over various wellness practices and products, is that a gap Boop is hoping to bridge? Yeah, I think we are. I think we're saying, look, there's there's a lot more. Um, you know, they're starting to be now, you know, studies that actually, um, that come out about meditation that was unheard of. And, you know, there, nobody yeah. would have done a double blind study on some of these modalities 15 years ago. And now you're starting to see that there is such a huge appetite for people feeling well, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, that, you know, business is having to listen to the consumer and adapt and, um, and so the more I think that people understand what's available and what's out there, um, the more that I think we as businesses have to respond to that. So I actually see now the consumer really driving the conversation mm -hmm. around wellness, which is fascinating. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And I mean, do you think Goop is placed under heavier scrutiny than other wellness brands because you're a celebrity or a female CEO or both? I think both. I think that, um, you know, we have been able to really continue to have traction and grow because I do think we are amazing at finding the content that's resonant with people before they even necessarily know they want to know that thing. Um, and the edit team has really has that gift. Um, and, you know, I think always it is so important that if you believe in something, um, even though it might not be popular, even though it might ruffle some feathers, even though, you know, people might not understand where you're coming from, like, true belief in, in what you're doing, especially if you are coming at it from a place of like this, I really believe this genuinely helps people. Right. I think in that way, you know, you, you, you're able to persevere because the it's coming from a very true intention. Right. No, that, yeah, that's really true. And, and in perusing your website, coffee and products, it strikes me that you seem to be in on the joke, or at least you don't mind putting yourself in the line of fire by selling a spray called psychic vampire repellent, which I think is just hilarious or provocatively naming those heretic candles. So can you talk to us about your marketing strategies or at least your corporate sense of humor? Well, you know, those, the people who know me well know that my irreverent sense of humor is very much at the core of who I am. And sometimes I think people are surprised by that because <laughs> I look a certain way or whatever assumptions they make about me. Um, but I think that uh, humor is, has always been a part of the Goo brand and the marketing. Um, we've always had, you know, pithy, funny subject lines. We've always... Um, you know, wanted to name our products, things that were, you know, funny and appealing and also said really clearly what they did. But I think right. humor is a great way um, to connect to a customer and for them to understand that you are in on the joke um, and that you have a relaxed, open approach um, in your marketing. And, you know, a lot of the, um, I guess a lot, you know, 
in the early days when we would write about something and it would get a lot of attention, that was not our intention. Like we, mm. we were not trying to create some kind of a, a publicity stunt whatsoever, but we did see that it drove a lot of interest and traffic to the site. So not that we do stunts all the time, but we do know the power of, you know, a, of a good, of a good joke or a racy, you know, name of a product. Yeah, no, it's interesting that these these cultural firestorms actually do help your business in the long run. But um, kind of going back to the topic of being a female entrepreneur, Harvard Business Review reports that women-led startups receive a paltry 2.3% of all venture capital funding, which is pretty shocking. So from your experience, can you talk to us about some of the challenges women face in launching businesses and in raising money? Yeah. Certainly. And then black and brown women receive even a, a tinier percentage of that. So um, look, I think it's changing. And I think that um, venture capitalists and are starting to understand that, you know, truly start to understand not, not just that it's a data point, but that women control, women are in charge of the spend of the house. Um, and we expect companies to come into the world that are resonant with us and that mirror our values. And there are so many brilliant female entrepreneurs who I think at this point will definitely have an easier time than I did or my peers. And that's a wonderful thing. Yeah. But I do think we have to work twice as hard and prove ourselves twice as much still, which, you know, I, I hope at some point there will be a more equitable approach to um, building businesses regardless of gender. But, you know, I think, I, I do honestly think that there are still those hurdles there, but it is, it is changing and getting better. Yeah. And, and what about some of the inevitable mistakes one makes, especially in the early days of running a business? Um, did you make any mistakes that our audience of future entrepreneurs out there might learn from? Oh my gosh, I have made so many mistakes, so many. And it's part of the problem with learning on the job and not having gone to business school and, or, you know, whatever the case may be. I think there's also kind of a, a beautiful side to that. Um, but, you know, when you, I mean, I, I just feel like the, the approach, um, I don't know, you know, it's, it's been such a fantastic and interesting journey to, to, to go through this. And, um, and I've learned so much about myself through the mistakes that I've made. Um, I've learned so much, not only about what not to do again, but how to examine the thinking behind why I made the wrong decision. And I would say, you know, always challenge the way that you see something and always challenge the way that you think something through, because I think the more that you're right and smart and an Ivy League kid and, you know, you will, you will be brilliant and articulate and you will convince people and yourself that you are right. And it can be a, it can be a detriment. You know, I just interviewed Adam Grant for our podcast and he talked about the power of rethinking something like make sure you're staying mentally agile right. um and that's something that i'm really trying to focus on now in terms of you know when i think of myself and the next iteration of myself as an entrepreneur just making sure that i don't rest on certainty yeah that's that's absolutely great advice um but let's let's talk about your business model now because what I found really interesting is, is how you tapped into an important niche in the retail business before anyone even knew to look for it, which is the idea of contextual commerce. So mm -hmm. can you tell us all about that? Sure. You know, it was a bit of a happy accident. I think the site was originally content for years. And I remember that I had written a piece about uh, the French, the 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 uh, Parisian pharmacies or in France, they the the products in the pharmacies they're amazing. And I used to go in and you know you find this lip balm and this homeopathic burn cream and you know probiotic tampons and all this amazing stuff that we don't have in our pharmacies. Yeah. So I've written this really comprehensive piece about all the things that I loved in the Parisian pharmacy. 
And I remember somebody writing and saying, this is so annoying. I just want to buy the stuff that you talk about. And I'm going to, you know, trying to find it on this website and that website and amazon.fr. And I wish I could just click a button and buy all this stuff that you've obviously curated and care so much about. And I thought, oh, that's actually really interesting. There is some amalgamation of commerce and content that is not happening yet. And if you do have authority as a curator and people trust you, then I thought, well, maybe there is room for this. Um, I was just always nervous about being transactional or seeming transactional. So it just, it took a while for me to get comfortable with it. That's, that is just brilliant. And are there any companies you admire who are doing this well? There is a men's brand called Huckberry that does Mm -hmm. contextual commerce really well. Um, Patagonia does it really well. Um, you know, if you, if you think about the companies that lead with story, that's, that's to me, contextual commerce, not leading with commerce, but having content on the side. It's like, what are the brands that you want, you gravitate to, towards story, um, around whatever it is that you're interested in sustainability or amazing fashion, or, you know, who, what are those brands that have a really clear point of view, um, and who are like the thrust behind it is to educate and to resonate. And then they have the appropriate ancillary product. Yeah. And, and you not only create a seamless shopping experience, don't you also make certain products yourself when you see there's a big demand for something you've written about on your editorial pages? Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. I think that's been the beauty of doing building this business very slowly over a long period of time is that we can see what the customer once. And then we also assess, you know, it's like when we did our skincare line, there really wasn't, um, you know, sort of aspirational clean skincare. There was really expensive skincare that had all kinds of chemicals in it. Some $500 moisturizer that even had antifreeze in it. And I'm not kidding you. Or, you know, there was kind of moisturizer at the health food store. And so I thought, well, there's, there has to be something that, um, that really works, has amazing efficacy that ha- we could, you know, really build for clinical results that is not $500, that is a better aspirational price point, And that also, um, you know, will work for, you know, an actress who wants real skincare that works, but that, that is not a toxic product. Yeah. And do you have any products that are on your dream list for Goop to develop next? Um, I would love to get into the CBD space. I think that there there's some really interesting um, studies around CBD um, and the efficacy of it, especially when there's a little bit of THC. But I think we're we're a ways away from that. The regulatory piece is still very difficult. Uh, that would be a terrific addition. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and looking at all your e-commerce business, what are your most popular products? Our, our skincare, we make amazing clean skincare that works beautifully. And so uh, we have like a, a microderm abrasion mimicking facial. Um, we have this incredible face oil that I use all the time. We just have great products. I really, I we work so hard to make them amazing and I'm really, really proud of them. And it's why I can sit before you at 48 years of age and, you know, not, like not. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> and in looking at, you know, you're looking at the last year, the pandemic has forced every company to rethink everything it's doing. So how has the pandemic affected Goop and, and how have you adapted? You know, it was, it's been tough. Um, we, you know, we had to switch from a growth model to a profitable model really quickly. That required some really, really difficult decisions. Um, ultimately, it was great for us to have to apply that kind of rigor to the way that we were operating and to really get as much operating leverage out of the core business as we could. Mm-hmm. But it was tough, you know. I mean, luckily we are in the content business, and and people were wanting content and connection. And luckily we did have, you know, e-commerce was strong, but we had a big experiential business that went to zero. Our retail business went to zero. 
um, our brand partnerships business was hit really, really hard. So, you know, it's like, like all businesses in, yeah. across the world, it was, um, well, except for businesses like Zoom and Slack, <laughs> um, we, as a retail business, as, as a, as a consumer business, we, we definitely had some rough patches for sure. Uh -huh. Wow, what what a shift! And has has Goop seen any shifts in the types of products people have been buying throughout the pandemic last year versus pre-pandemic? Yeah, I mean we saw crazy interest in home, so pots and pans and cookbooks and um, soft home pillows, candles. Um, people really seem to, at a certain point, look around and be like, I, I, I have to do, I need something to, you know, make the space more exciting. People were cooking a lot more. We definitely saw that. Um, and obviously comfortable loungewear um, sold through very well and tops, you know, things yeah. that you could wear that, you know, maybe had a little puff sleeve like this, but you could wear sweatpants and slippers on the bottom. And clothing wise, is it still all about sweatpants? I mean, it's interesting, like the data still shows us that people are still, um, I mean, luckily we're not, you know, we're not in evening wear and that's not our business. So right. we're more for, you know, casual and, and professional kind of women. Um, but I think we're, you're seeing a little bit of a, of a bounce back and some more interest in like casual dresses, but people are still home and not investing in, you know, crazy. I mean, at least in our business, that, that's what we're seeing. Right. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And, and on the subject of clothing, um, Goop is famous for its high-end collaborations with top designers like Stella McCartney, who we just spoke to from Fashion Week last Friday. But you've also teamed up with lower price brands like Banana Republic and CBT2 for furniture and just the other day, Majuri for jewelry, um, all of which make Goop a little less aspirational. So can you tell us about your collaboration strategy and we'll lower price lines be a new trend for Goop, perhaps broadening the audience? Well, I'm going to disagree with you about um, being less aspirational because I don't think asp aspirational has anything to do with price point. I think it has to do with quality and values. Um, and I think it's much more of a feeling than, than thinking it has to be expensive. And, yeah. you know, my, my goal as we continue to go forward and hope, you know, it's interesting, for example, in the skincare, when we first launched, the price of the raw materials is so much more expensive than a drugstore brand. And when we're really focused on ingredients that won't harm your endocrine system or won't be irritating, um, but we are seeing with economies of scale. And as I say, the customer's really demanding that products are cleaner and cleaner. So I think you'll be able to see price points come down we're also focused on um, creating accessible products across all the categories. And I think it's okay to have an expensive cream, for example, but at the same time, you also want to offer something amazing at a lower price point um, right. to attract a, a, another customer as well. Because, you know, there are a lot of like-minded people in the world who want amazing products that aren't toxic. And so we want to be able to offer something for all of them. Yeah, no, that, that, that's really interesting and it makes a lot of sense. And are there any new collaborations in the pipeline now so everyone can say they heard it first at Brown Fashion? <laughs> We're always working on collaborations. Um, we have two really interesting ones that are coming down the pike, but I can't, mm. it's a little early for me to say who they're with. Well, we look forward to seeing it when it comes out. Mm -hmm. But kind of talking about your G-Label collection that you design and, and manufacture, it's interesting because you've said, you know, you don't consider yourself a fashion designer. So what was the inspiration for creating your wonderful own line? <laughs> well, I'm a fashion customer and I have been for many, many years. And I did see a white space in the fashion sector in that, you know, and there's been obviously a lot of talk about this recently and especially through COVID that the delivery schedules that have been determined for years by the big box retailers seem antiquated and arcane. And that, you know, the, I, I always wanted the idea of like, you know, if you went into a big department store um, in August and it was 98 degrees out, it was all heavy wool sweaters and leather. And 
um, shearling and and I thought this is so strange. You can never buy anything that you can then yeah. wear tonight. So I think the buy now, wear now approach that we've taken at Goop has been great. I think women really respond to that. Um, and, you know, as far as, you know, I, I love clothes and, but I also am sort of a classic kind of, you know, former tomboy. Um, and so for me, you know, I, I did see space for, elevated basics, you know, that, and, and our take on sustainability, although we're moving more, more and more towards sustainable fabrics, um, is that, you know, if you buy something that is great quality and it's not overtly trendy, you can keep it forever. And so that's why we always say buy now, wear now, keep forever. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And on the topic of sustainability, I know it's an important consideration of Goop that touches every product you sell. So can you tell us how it's being addressed, especially in the fashion side, because it's such a complex issue with so much to consider from fabrics to inventory and the whole supply chain? It's absolutely true. Um, you know, look, we're always trying to do better and better and better, whether it's packaging or components. Um I think with the fa on the fashion side, we're pretty sustainable in that, you know, as I said, we're, we're very focused on the non-disposable fashion. We also do very limited units so that we're not, you know, it's part of the ethos is we don't, we try not, we try to sell out quickly so that we're not stuck with a lot of inventory that we're getting rid of. Um, yeah. But, you know, we, we, we also have been looking into these incredible new yarns that are being made um, from plastic bottles from the ocean. And wow. I think you'll start to see really interesting advances um, in terms of sustainability. And, and by the way, that are done in ways um, that are sustainable through the whole supply chain. So not just one aspect is addressed, but then there are other deleterious consequences to how the garment is made, you know, start to see like a holistic 360 sustainable yes. approach. I, I really believe it's coming. It's, it's what we all want as consumers, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you've talked about simply owning less, which I think is the ultimate sustainability. And it, it makes me think of your G collection because the pieces are so timeless. You, you never need to replace them. <laughs> Thank you. And um, I know last week you launched an exciting venture with the Goop Ghost Kitchen. So can you tell us what was the impetus for that? Sure. Well, food has always, obviously always been a major pillar for us at Goop. And I've always been a foodie and a, and a home amateur chef. And, um, and we, you know, our recipe content is super popular and we've always set out to try to make healthy food that's cool and delicious and where you're not sacrificing flavor or texture or anything like that. And so we thought, you know, as, as an extension of the business, like how could we go into the food space and we were approached to partner with an amazing company that's really, really good at this and um, has done multiple fast casual restaurants. And we thought we were going to start with a restaurant and a cloud kitchen. And then when COVID happened, we thought, well, let's just start with the cloud kitchen. Um, and it's just been amazing. I mean, we just have one little, we've just started with one little cloud kitchen in Santa wow. Monica. It's just been gangbusters. I mean, we, I feel bad because every day, you know, we have to say, okay, that's it. We're tapped out. We can't deliver, but hopefully we'll be able to meet the demand better and we're opening others. Um, it's been, it's been a great success so far. And is that something you'd like to scale up to other areas of the country? Oh, for sure. For sure. We would, you know, I, I don't see a ton of really innovative, healthy food that's um, accessible and, so I'm, I'm really, I think it would be great to have, to expand, you know, throughout California, outside of California, across the country and just, and give people accessibility to super delicious, unprocessed, yeah. healthy food. Well, if you bring one to Providence, Brown students will go crazy for it, <laughs> but kind of changing gears here, because I think students would love to hear that apparently you're not afraid to cold call people for advice, which actually must work since that's how I contacted you about speaking at Brown Fashion Week. So can you tell us your thoughts on reaching out and sharing best practices, especially between women and, and also the importance of mentors? Absolutely. I mean, I, I am so thankful for the mentors that I've been able to find and cultivate. Um, and it's such an important part of continuing to grow the business 
and again, to think about rethinking the business at every inflection point. Um, I think that cold calling is absolutely great. And I think you'll hear story after story of, you know, Fortune 500 CEOs who get an email from a student and say, like, this is my intention. This is, this is, you know, could I do X, Y, and Z? I think um, it's always good in the email to clearly state like who you are and where you're from um, and, you know, where you go to school, for example, if you're in school or where you went to school um, and to be succinct and very clear about what it, what your ask is, as opposed to, oh, I'd love to pick your brain on, you know, yeah. <laughs> performance marketing and, you know, or whatever. So um, I think spe- brevity and specificity and, and be brave, like think of that person. And, you know, it's funny, I was, um, I was talking to an amazing female founder the other day called named Jen Hyman and who founded Rent the Runway. Mm. And, you know, she just sort of, she just guessed Diane von Furstenberg's email until she got the right one and then went and had a, you know, meeting with her. So there are a lot of ways to, uh, to hack the system, I think. And, you know, just, just do it, just be brave. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's really encouraging, especially for all of us graduating and entering the job market soon. Um, Keep an eye on the time. I think we should probably turn it over to a few audience questions before it gets too late. And they were so fun to receive Um, and diving right in. The first question comes from Anastasia Chase, who is a RISD student from Marion, Massachusetts, who's also Fashion Brown's graphic design head. And um, I'm glad she asked this question because we didn't have time to talk about the Goop Lab. And Anastasia says, I watched the Goop Lab last year and I was wondering how your team gathered the courage to try all of these new psychedelics and Wim Hof's cold therapy. (laughs) Well, I think, we we kind of sent out an Excel spreadsheet to the team, like who wants to participate in, in any one of these episodes? And I thought, I hope someone's gonna wanna do this stuff. <laughs> it, was, it was amazing how many volunteers we had. We, could, we had way more um, demand than we did supply. I think, look, like the people who work at Goop are very forward thinking, very curious people and um, people who are ready to try things to see if it might be beneficial for them. So it was, it was easier than you thought, than you would think. Well, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm an ice plunge kind of girl, but I guess you never know until you try it. You never know. <laughs> but um, moving briskly along, our next question comes from Reno Hashimoto from New York City. She's a comparative literature major at Brown who's a member of Fashion at Brown's business team. And she asks, what's your favorite fashion moment in cinema? Oh my, that's a good question. Um, my mind goes right to Audrey Hepburn. Um, I just, you know, her proportions and the way that she wore things and her elegance, uh, probably Audrey Hepburn in Roman Holiday. Yeah, I tried to imagine how you might answer this and I envisioned you choosing someone like Grace Kelly or Lauren Bacall and <laughs> Audrey Hepburn is perfect. Um, and Reno asks another question which is how have you created a diverse and inclusive workplace at Goop and have you found any specific initiatives to be effective? Well, I think it's, you know, it's something that we have to all be very conscious of. And um, so we've always cultivated a diverse environment and we've always cultivated a diverse group of employees. I think it's critical for getting real insight across different points of view. Um, and I, I'm so glad that the world at large, it will certainly America has um, been thinking about the way to really make it, make it a priority, you know, to include a rich, um, a, a rich array of, of voices and backgrounds um, into business and to, you know, to also acknowledge that we need to we need to do more than we think and we need to change more than we thought we need to change. Yeah, no, that's that's so true. Um, and our next question comes from Laurel Smith from Madison, Wisconsin, who's studying economics at Duke University. And Laurel asks, how do you describe your leadership approach at Goop? 
<laughs> well, you know, it's, it's ever evolving, right? I mean, I didn't come up through a corporate structure, so I didn't have old bosses to model or to avoid, you know, their kind of bad behavior. And it's just been something that I've had to sort of instinctually understand, but also get a lot of coaching on. So, you know, I have a great executive coach who helps me think about this all the time. Um, and it's, it's funny because I think it's different for men and women. I think that there is a type of leading from the feminine that is emerging. I think for a long time, women in executive positions were approximating the more male archetype in trying to be a boss. And I don't do that. I am trying to uncover what it means to lead from the feminine, to embrace the, my, my femininity, to find the strength through that femininity as opposed to trying to act like a man. Um, so I, I learn actually a lot about myself from thinking about how to be a leader um, and, and how to adjudicate um, those more sort of archetypal male qualities like boundaries and structure with the, with the also archetypal f feminine qualities of collaboration and, right. and creativity. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, and so we have another question from Ariqueta Osorio, who is a big fan of yours from Brazil. And she asks, do you think the pandemic will have permanently changed fashion or the fashion industry in any way? You know, that's a good question. I do think that there's going to be a bit of revenge shopping when this is done and people are going to want to dress up and go out and have fun. And we might have a version of the roaring twenties that they had a hundred years ago. Um, but I also do think that the consumer in this day and age is far more aware of the impact of fashion. And I think also being all of us being home for a year, um, I would I would guess that we are going to want to be comfortable, that we've gotten comfortable being comfortable. It doesn't mean you can't be fashionable or unique, but I wonder how quickly we'll go back to certain things that are hard and uncomfortable to wear. Yeah. And um, she also asks, what creative advice would you give to your 21 year old self? What creative advice? I mean, I think that I would just encourage my 21 year old self. Um, I mean, you know, I, I, as, as a 21 year old, I was pretty bold. I was pretty uh, weirdly fearless and uh, had a ton of creativity rushing through my body. And um, so I think maybe I would, um, again, just tell myself, you know, to think things through a little bit more, you know, I think I was more impetuous as, as a 21 year old. And I took, I took a lot of risks, which were great. Um, but I think I would want my 21 year old self to be acting from like the, a truer place than I did when I was 21. And Henry Cueto from Brazil wants to know what's the most important fashion tip you have received and you can share with us. And I think that is probably our last audience question we've time for. I mean, I would say dress like yourself. You know, it, dressing is such a expression of who you are. And I think a lot of us dress because we think we're wearing the right thing or the wrong thing, or we want someone to have a certain impression or we don't wear something that we really want to wear because we're worried it will make the wrong impression or people will draw, you know, a judgment about us that we don't want them to. But I think we should unabashedly wear the clothes that make us feel the, that, like we're being the truest to ourselves, you know, come what may. I love that. And Gwyneth, we're almost out of time, but before we say goodbye, I'd love to ask you one last question because you've talked a great deal about the importance of engaging fully in one's life to make a positive impact. 
As many of us will graduate this spring and head out into the world during this unusually challenging moment in time, do you have any thoughts or words of wisdom you'd like to leave us with here tonight? You know, I mean, I, I keep sort of coming back to the same thing, but I, I do think that the more that you can act in accordance with your truest self and have the courage to speak from that place and really be in integrity. Like if to me, integrity means your words and your actions are completely intertwined. I think you will find happiness quicker. You know, life is um, challenging and there it's laden with disappointments. Um, but if you go through the process in integrity, saying what you mean, listening to yourself, I think that's the quickest way to experience peace and then therefore your own version of success. Well, that is truly inspirational. Thank you, Gwyneth. And I think that's also the perfect note to close our talk tonight. But first, I'd like to thank our audience for joining us and we hope we'll see you at our virtual runway show on Friday. Most of all, I'd like to thank you, Gwyneth. We are so grateful and your presence has meant so much to everyone listening here tonight, but especially to all of us at Brown University and Fashion at Brown. So thank you. That's very kind of you. Thank you for having me. Well, we hope you'll come back and talk to us again someday soon, maybe teach a business class. Anytime. <laughs> well, we are ready to have you back. <laughs> and I hope everyone has a lovely evening. Thank you again, Gwyneth. And My pleasure. Goodbye from Providence. Bye.